Thank you for having me here, and thank you for, uh, for showing up. Yeah, I guess that's the oddball session of the conference, so I'm, I'm quite proud of that, actually. So my name is Julian. I'm a tech evangelist with uh, AWS. Uh, I'm based in, in the Paris office, but I do travel a lot. And uh, these days, I, I tend to focus on uh, AI and ML topics, uh, which are somehow related to what I'm going to talk about today, and that is FPGA. So here's the agenda. We're going to make a case for FPGAs. You know, why do we even bother talking about this? Then we're going to talk about what an FPGA is, actually. Um, some of you might not be familiar with this, uh, with this architecture. Um, then we're going to show uh, how to use FPGAs on AWS. Uh, and I'll mention some customers of ours. Uh, I'll do a really quick demo of uh, loading and using an FPGA image on AWS. And then I'll close with a, a few thoughts on using FPGAs for deep learning. And I'll share some resources that you may find useful. OK, so why do we even think that FPGAs are relevant? I guess we've all seen this a million times. I hope I don't have to, uh, to explain it. Moore's law, one of the most important laws in, <laughs> in computer science and computer hardware, right? saying that you know, every 18 months, magically, uh, we tend to uh, double the number of, uh, of transistors. But not, not everything is well, right? I mean, it worked very well for, for a while. It started in 1971 with the first uh, Intel chip. And for decades, it was fine. But now, we, maybe we're reaching the end of that trip, right? Uh, we're still managing to cram transistors on, on, on silicon but we have to actually uh, uh, limit the, the, the clock speed because um, heat dissipation is such an issue right now. Anyway, we managed to build some insanely powerful chips like this one, right, which is uh, available in most of our instances. Um, it's an IN Xeon chip. It's got 7.1 billion transistors. Um, it is a general purpose architecture, x64, uh, single instruction, single data with some uh, uh, vector extensions. It still delivers the best single core performance. So if you need one core, one thread to run as fast as it can, that's still the best choice, right? I mean, you cannot beat that. You get some parallelism. Um, this specific chip has uh, four, uh, 28 core, uh, 24 cores, sorry, and 48 hyper threads. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still a fairly low number, right? Um, especially given the fact that we all know how hard it is to write multi-threaded apps, uh, how to make them run successfully, that's one thing, and how to make them run actually parallel, right? There's always some blocking involved. Could be in your app, could be in a library that you use, it could be in the operating system. The bottom line is, you know, it's hard, and we never get that full parallelism promise. And yeah, there's the power consumption issue, um, these beasts, tend to burn uh, 160 plus watts, which is a lot. Still, they're very cool. And uh, um, we, we published this blog article just maybe uh, a week or so ago. Uh, one of our customers, Cle Clemson University, has run uh, a large, a very large job using uh, for NLP on 1 million plus uh, virtual CPUs. Right, so that's, and they use spot instances to do that. Uh, otherwise, I guess their budget would have been <laughs> an issue too. So you can still run very, very large applications, you know, HPC applications, AI applications, using a crazy number of uh, CPU cores, right? That's possible. It's not because it's possible that it's the, the absolute best solution. Um, so a lot of people think that Moore, uh, the Moore's law is actually coming to an end, including Mr. Moore himself. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a joke that says that the number of people that think Moore's law is coming to an end is also doubling every 18 months. Um, but you know, when Mr. Moore says that, uh, we have to listen. Um, there has to be technology limits, right? I mean, the latest Intel architecture um, is called Skylake. And the Skylake transistor is 100 atoms wide. So OK, we'll get to 50. <laughs> we'll get to 30, right? But, and then you know, something weird is going to happen. So you know, 
God bless Intel and, and all the hardware designers, but even them at some point will have to admit that they cannot go any further. Right? And another issue is that um, some workloads just require uh, much more parallelism than what you get with CPUs, right? So you, yes, you can take you know, 100,000 uh, multi-core CPUs and throw them at the problem, but then what about software? What about distributed systems? What about everything? Um, core count is just not a, the single thing, right? You have to make them run in parallel. So um, use cases like genomics, financial computing, image, video encoding, and deep learning, they really require a lot of parallelism to run right. And as we know, uh, the age of the GPU has come. And again, uh, here's a, a fantastic GPU uh, by NVIDIA. This one has 21 billion transistors. Uh, it's, it's a massive chip, right? Uh, 1.36 square inch, right? That, think about it. I mean, it's, it's a hell of a mouthful, right? Um, it, it has an architecture op optimized for floating point, so that's good because that's what we need for HPC and, and, and all those use cases I mentioned. Uh, the architecture is, is SIMT, so we have a single instruction uh, set run by multiple threads on CUDA cores, etc. And this one is massively parallel, right? I mean, we have over 5,000 CUDA cores, and this chip introduces a new type of core called tensor cores. So it's able to run actual calculation on the 3D uh, uh, arrays. Um, we use the CUDA programming model, which is kind of friendly, right? Um, and these chips have a ton of DRAM off chip where you can actually run the computation, right? But, you know, each of those chips is going to need 250 watts, right? So that's a lot as well. And as it happens, these are not optimal for some applications. Uh, one obvious problem is power consumption, right? And power efficiency. Uh, think about, I mean, uh, who's doing embedded work here? All right, no one. We need to bring the embedded developers to, to velocity, right? Uh, but if you do embedded, embedded stuff, you know, uh, you will never have 250 watts to spend on, the, on, the, on calculation. Uh, power efficiency is a different metric, um, uh, and we measure teraops per watt, right? Which is how much, how well spent is my power budget, in a way, when it comes to computation. Latency requirements are important. GPUs, you know, uh, not, don't necessarily have uh, predictable latency. That's a problem. And plus, oh, the weird stuff, right? Custom data types. You don't want to work on 32-bit uh, floats. You want to work on 14-bit integers because that's what your app uses. Um, um, it could be even more complicated than that. Your, your app could show uh, irregular parallelism, so you could have massively parallel uh, parts in your app, and then you could have maybe more sequential uh, parts in your app. And then, you know, GPUs would not be very efficient at that. Uh, divergence is where, is when uh, um, multiple threads will actually execute different code. And again, that's something that GPUs are not best at. So, some people think it's a good idea to build your own uh, ASIC, right? Application-specific uh, IC. To, to solve this, and, and yeah, you, you can do that. You can go and build uh, a deep learning ASIC. You can build a video encoding ASIC. You can build a, a genomics ASIC, et cetera, et cetera. And more power to those guys. But it's a huge effort. It takes time. You know, you, some, it's not something you'll get done in less than a year. Um, what if you get it wrong? You know, you have to start from scratch. And what if your application requirements evolve? The AS part means application specific. So if your application changes, maybe your ASIC is you know, obsolete and you have to do that all over again. And so these factors have led a number of people to consider FPGAs. So what's an FPGA? So FPGAs have been around for a while. Um, the first commercial product uh, dates back to 1985 by Xilinx. And FPGA means Field Programmable Gate Array. And that's a really cool name, because that's really what it is, right? In tech, we love to give names to things, 
and that are confusing and do not actually tell you what that thing does. Um, this is a good name because an FPGA is exactly a field programmable gate array, right? As I will explain in a minute. So cool, good name. It's not a CPU. You could build a CPU with FPGA. Uh, an FPGA is just, it's Lego hardware, right? So it's a bag of logic cells, lookup tables, logic, ga uh, logic gates, DSPs, IO connection, etc. right? So it's really just a big bag of everything uh, I just mentioned. Unconnected, right? Waiting to be connected. Um, there's a small amount of on-chip memory. So small here means, you know, we're not going to get gigabytes, right? Um, so we're going to get something in the range of megabytes. And the name of the game would, will be to build custom logic, so to combine all those gates and DSPs and IO pins to build logic that speeds up your software application. So here's a typical example, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a fabric with all those different types of building blocks and that interconnect that, that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, just empty at the moment. And, uh, and the name of the game here will be to connect everything, right? So you're going to design a logic and using software, you're going to select blocks on the FPGA and connect them to achieve what you want, right? And that's basically what you do when you develop FPGA applications. So what language do you use? Well, in the good old days, uh, you would use uh, runtime languages, uh, so which are domain specific, called VHDL and Verilog. And uh, these are pretty uh, different from the software languages that we know, right? They really, really, uh, uh, you really have to describe the gates and how they connect to one another. And it's, it's a very specific field, right? It's really expert work. Uh, more recently, there's a new framework called OpenCL, uh, which supports C++, and that allows you to build um, FPGA apps with C++ code in a similar way that you would use CUDA, right, to write um, GPU apps. Then, uh, using one of those environments, uh, using uh, specifically uh, 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 yeah, one of those languages, you're going to use um, a pretty complex software suite uh, to do design and simulation, so software simulation, hardware simulation, synthesis, which is, okay, what are the gates that I need to actually build this app, and routing, which is, okay, now where do I find those gates on the actual FPGA, right? The, the floor, on that floor plan, what, what are, where are my gates? And then I'm going to upload that, uh, that, uh, that bitstream file. I'm going to upload it to an emulator or an evaluation board, um, you know, something, some actual device that will behave exactly that, like the FPGA does. And in both cases, for the software tools and the hardware tools, these are insanely expensive. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars per developer seat, right? Um, and they're hard to scale, right? You need five more boards for tomorrow to speed up testing or whatever. <coughs> well, guess what? <laughs> they're expensive, so... You know, you need to negotiate, you need to buy them, you need to have them delivered, and that's a problem, right? So, so usually, you know, those are really, really precious. You have one or two, except maybe if you work for a very, very large company, and literally you have to work to timeshare um, the boards between the teams, how, you know, because they're so expensive. So there has to be a better way to write FPGA apps. And this is the problems that we try to solve for our customers. So the first step was to build EC2 instances um, providing GPA, uh, FPGA, <laughs> I was confused, a mix of GPU and FPGA, uh, FPGA uh, chips, right? And that's the F1 family. Uh, it comes in two sizes. Uh, so the smallest one is really for development purposes. It's got one FPGA. And the second one is really for production. It's got eight. FPGAs, and those eight FPGAs are actually interconnected by a super, super fast uh, bus, 400 gigabits per second. So they can actually exchange data and, and talk to one another. So imagine the, the speed, the computation speed you can get. So those chips are Xilinx chips, very high-end chips, right? 
64 gigs of memory per chip, right? So that's off, um, off FPGA memory, but still 64 gigs per FPGA, right? The typical GPU would have maybe 10 gigs. Um, you have PCI connections to talk to the host, to the CPU, actually. actually. Um, and we mentioned, you know, those are building blocks, and there are a few blocks on those FPGAs. You get 2.5 million logic elements and almost 7,000 DSP blocks, right? So that's a big, big Lego box to pick from. Um, the development cycle, oh, sorry, the tools first. Uh, so that's the FPGAs, uh, the chips and the instances. So we also provide an Amazon machine image to boot um, those uh, instances. They include all the tools that you need. So the Xilinx uh, tools, um, the Vivado environment, etc. If you guys have done uh, Xilinx development before, you should be familiar with those names. Um, there's a free license included. So that's pretty nice. You don't have to actually pay for those tools. Uh, you can do VHDL, you can do Verilog, and you can do OpenSeal as well. Um, but AMI also includes an SDK, uh, which um, uh, includes some tools to manage the, the FPGA images that we're going to build. So how to load them, actually, on the FPGAs, how to uh, remove them, etc. cetera. Um, so using command line tools. And there's a hardware development kit that makes it easier for FPGA developers to actually interface the FPGA code with the, with the external devices, right? So how to access memory, how to access um, the PCI bus, how to access that high-speed uh, ring uh, between the, FG, the FPGAs, et cetera, et cetera. It's called the shell. You'll see that in the documentation. So just to make your life a little simpler. So actually, you don't need to run all of this on an FPGA instance. You could run it on a normal CPU-based instance which is likely to be less expensive. You can do all the simulation, all the synthesis, all the routing on, for example, a C4 instance, and then you would get the image, and then you would load that image on an FPGA instance, on an F1 instance, right? So you can have a pretty cheap and easy to scale way to do development and, and testing, and then use the F1 instances just for the actual final testing and production, of course. So here's the cycle. So we're going to take that AMI. Uh, we're going to boot up an F1 instance. Uh, we're going to load uh, the FPGA image to one of the FPGAs connected to the instance. And we're going to run our host application on the CPU, right? That's pre that's, it's pretty similar to what we do with GPUs, right? We run something on the CPU, and then it loads data on the GPU and, and, and get things going. And one of the cool things that we introduced is that you can actually publish and sell your um, FPGA images on the AWS marketplace, just like people have been doing for a while for AMIs. So if you're a developer, if you're an FPGA developer and you come up with a clever way to do, uh, you know, um, I don't know, crypto or any kind of uh, FPGA app, then you can actually publish it to the marketplace and, and make money out of it, which is a totally new way to, uh, to monetize FPGA apps. So here's a, an example, a customer example. It's called Edico Genome, and um, they build a product called Dragon. Uh, that's a good name to uh, to basically you know analyze human genome, and they used to do that on CPU and 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 I would say traditional architectures, and they rewrote their app to run on FPGA, and they divided. Um, the, 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 the analysis time by a factor of 10, right? So what took hours now takes minutes, which is important because obviously they can deliver results faster to hospitals and people who might be waiting for, uh, for the, the medical information, right? So it's all implemented with the FPGA, super fast uh, and pretty low cost because you can just fire up an F1 instance, run an analysis, or a bunch of analysis and shut down the instance and stop paying, right? So until uh, actually uh, two days ago, you would pay by the hour, but you know, starting op October 2nd, EC2 billing is per second. So it's even better for those cases, right? Just fire up a few instances, run your batches, get the results, shut them down, right? Pretty efficient. Uh, here's another example. Uh, it's another company called NG Codec. 
And these guys do uh, ultra HD video compression, you know, which is really one of the cases where uh, parallelism matters. Um, they're over 50 times faster than their previous solution. They're running on CPUs using typical tools. And more importantly, uh, they get higher quality. So they're able to do 60 plus frame per second, which is very high, um, with the same bitrate and higher quality. Right? So before that, you had to choose. You could do very high quality encoding, but it would not be real time at all. You would have to wait. So you would have to encode and then broadcast. Now, using this solution, they can actually uh, encode and broadcast with very, very low latency, right? So that's the benefit of uh, FPGA. And again, they can do that optimized cost. If they need to scale uh, their uh, encoding capacity, just fire up more instances, deliver to broadcasters, and then shut down everything, right? Imagine there's a, I don't know, a large event, uh, you know, football game, whatever it is. They need extra capacity. They can get that in minutes. And then once the game is over and they don't need to compress that uh, video anymore, they can just shut it down, right? So let's look at a quick demo. So here are the steps. So as, I will, as you will see, I cannot do the full demo because it takes a while. <laughs> so I'm just showing the steps and I, I will just do the final operation here. So, um, so initially I did this, right? I booted uh, an F1 instance. I set up a whole bunch of uh, environments. You'll find all of this on our GitHub repository, which I'll point you to. Then um, I, I run software simulations. I run hardware simulations, and everything was fine. And then I built the final FPGA image, right? Uh, and the problem is, even with a simple hello world, and this example here uh, just adds a couple of vectors, right? A, a, so that's a simple example. It's in OpenCL. I'll show you the code in a minute. Um, synthesis takes, is that two and a half hours or something? So I can't do that live, but you can repeat those steps. Yeah. So you learn patience again when you do FPGA stuff. So that's uh, the, 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 the file that uh, I got from, uh, from the, the, the routing tool. Then I need to transform that into an actual FPGA image using that script. Um, which is too tiny for me to read, create uh, whatever AFI, <laughs> right? That's going to create the actual uh, Amazon FPGA image, right? And it's copying that to S3 and registering it into, uh, uh, into the uh, F1 backend, okay? So then I have to wait for a little bit before that image is actually built because we need to, uh, we need to actually merge the image with the the hardware development kit that I mentioned, the, the shell, takes a few minutes. So for a while, you know, you'll see this pending state. Um, and then you get to that state where it's ready, right? And you can actually go and load it and do something useful. And that's where I'm taking over. So hopefully my instance is still up. <laughs> I'm not paying my AWS bills. Yeah. I keep saying that's the only reason I joined them. I have a huge sandbox and I'm not paying. Okay, so I'm connected to my instance here, right? Uh, let me show you the code very quickly. So um, I've got two parts. I've got the host code, right, running on the CPU, and I've got the FPGA code, the, what we call the kernel, just like for GPUs, that's going to be running on the FPGAs. Um, so let's look at the, maybe the kernel first. And it, it's very straightforward, right? So again, that's the code we're going to transform into logic gates and run on the FPGA, right? And anyone could write this. So we're adding two vectors. Uh, the size is going to be 256 bytes. So we have to allocate two arrays. And we're going to uh, initialize the arrays with the A parameters and the B parameters that the kernel will receive. And just we just sum them up, right? We have a third buffer to run the sum and, uh, and store it. OK? No questions, I guess. <laughs> but see, that's, that's, right? that's cool. That's OpenCL. If we try to do the same thing with a VHDL of Verilog, it would be pages and pages. 
and it literally no one could understand it unless they were a proper VHD and Veridog experts, which I am not. Uh, and uh, voila, as we say. So thank you, OpenCL. And when it comes to the host, okay, so that's uh, normal C++ code. So we're going to create uh, two vectors. One is full of tens, one is full of 32s, okay? Uh, and this is for results. Then we're getting access to our uh, FPGA device. Okay, we need to do some initialization here. It's not really important. Then these are important, okay? Now we're going to allocate buffers on the FPGA, right? Uh, we're going to uh, send uh, write commands to the FPGA to say, you need to fill those FPGAs with the vectors I initialized, right? The tens and the 32s, okay? And I'm gonna put the results here, okay? And then literally, I'm running the kernel, right? So if you've done GPU programming, CUDA programming, it's, it, it's kind of similar, it's, the, it's, it's different, but it's the same, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? Same level of abstractions and same, uh, pretty much same way to, uh, to think. And then we're going to run that computation on the host, run the computation on the GPU, and hopefully we get the same results, right? Make sense? All right. Okay, so I don't want to save some typing, so First, let me check, whoops. I'm gonna use my SDK here to make sure nothing is loaded. Yep, yeah, so nothing is loaded on that, uh, on that FPGA right now, so I'm gonna load it. Okay, so I'm using that identifier that I got from the uh, uh, describe API that you saw earlier. Okay, it should take just a few seconds. And then we should be able to, yeah, so here it is, okay? So what, what did we do here? We took that image that I generated and copied to S3, and I, I loaded it on one of my GPA, uh, FPGAs, on the FPGA, actually, because there's only one here. Okay, and now I just need to run, set some environments again, and run my program. And that's, that's it, okay? So I run that uh, C++ program that you just saw, uh, allocated some vectors, allocated some memory on the FPGAs, copied the data to the FPGAs, and run that kernel on the FPGA, right? And 10 plus 32 is 42, right? And if you want to count that there are indeed 256 values, be my guest, okay? so. This is pretty simple, right? I mean, of course you would have to learn OpenCL, but I'm sure you guys have learned more complicated things. Uh, you wouldn't have to learn uh, VHDL or Verilog. Uh, and the thing is, with this very clever app, you know, I could probably make a lot of money. So I could take that, uh, uh, yeah, that FPGA image, put it on the marketplace, and you would only have to do exactly what I did, right? Grab it, load it, run it, right? I would just give you a little information on how to use it, but that's it. You wouldn't have to code anything, you wouldn't have to uh, synthesize and route and, and wait for hours, you can just grab it and run it, right? Which is, I think, very nice and innovative. So, um, just a few words on uh, FPGAs and deep learning. So, GPUs rule deep learning, um, as, we, uh, as we all know. But maybe there's a chink in the armor, right? So they're great for training because training is all about uh, running tons of matrix operations in parallel. So the more you can run in parallel, the faster you'll train, right? And you do that on, on a large uh, number of samples. So you get maximum throughput, that's great. But what about inference? What about actually using models? When you do inference, Sometimes you're going to run, let's say you classify images. Sometimes you're gonna classify maybe 200 images in a row, and that's fine, GPUs will work fine. 
But sometimes you need to classify just one image, right? One image every second or every once in a while. And in this case, um, GPUs are not great because GPUs have been built for throughput. They're crunching machines. Uh, and if you want to have large batches of images, then you have to wait for enough images to be available. Right, so let's say you want to wait for 32 or 64 images to be available before you run inference. Well, if you're the guy that sent the first image, you have to wait for 31 or 63 additional images. So your latency is going to be degraded compared to just having your image classified. And if you actually say, okay, I'm going to run inference on every single image, then you pay the GPU tax of uh, you know, allocating memory, starting the kernels, etc. So again, you know, throughput is not going to be great, right? Because you have to pay that tax of setting up everything, running inference, getting the results, etc. So you have to choose before between uh, latency or throughput. And obviously, power and memory requirements. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to do this again on IoT devices or uh, mobile devices, you know, power budget. Uh, and memory budget are always going to matter. Um, so you can actually implement neural networks on FPGAs. It's been done. Uh, it's been done for a while. So here's a here's an example. So that's a very simple network, and the key operation in neural networks is what we call multiply and accumulate, which is really we, for a given neuron. Uh, this one, for example. For a given neuron, we take inputs, we multiply each of them by the corresponding weight. That's the multiply part. And then we add everything together, that's the accumulate part. Then we run it through the activation function. Right? So but this is a really basic example, but just to show you that actually you can do that, right? You take multipliers, you take adders, and it's very easy to say, well, those four inputs and those four weights. Well, guess what? I can build a multiply and accumulate operation, right? The DSP cells that you find in FPGAs, they know how to do that perfectly. So it's not complicated, right? The thing is, um, if you have 32-bit floats, you know, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of uh, FPGA space you're going to use, right? You're going you're gonna to need lots of gates to do floating part operations. So we should be able to um, uh, run this efficiently provided that uh, we can actually use smaller weights and smaller models. And actually, there's a ton of research actually to do that uh, uh, currently. So one technique is called quantization. So instead of using 32-bit floats, uh, it, it, has, it has been shown that you can use 8-bit ints. You can even go down to 2-bit integers for weights. And things still work pretty well, right? Um, so this reduces power consumption because int operations are much, much less uh, power hungry than float operations. Um, and it, of course, it simplifies the logic, right? If you need to multiply uh, four bit ints, it's quite simpler than multiplying 32 bit floats. So you're going to save gates and again, save, uh, save power, right? Another technique is called pruning. It's about removing um, un unneeded connections. So neural networks have millions and millions of parameters of connections. Some of them, actually a lot of them, are not that necessary when you have a trained model. So you can find the ones that don't matter and remove them. And again, um, this saves memory. And then uh, compression is important. Uh, once you have a quantized quant Quantitized? <laughs> What's the word? <laughs> Once you have moved from 32-bit floats to 4-bit ints, let's say, then you don't have so many values for your weights, right? 4 bits, that's going to be 16 possible values. So you can do compression, right? Um, the, the scope of weights for weights is much smaller. So you can actually then compress them with a dictionary or a technique like that and save memory again. So at the end of the day, you will end up with much smaller models. Right? You can move your model from, let's say, hundreds of megabytes to maybe tens of uh, megabytes. And then it's possible to actually load the complete model, all the weights. It's possible to load it on the FPGA itself, right? on-chip on memory versus off-chip memory. And so that's going to be a huge speed advantage and a huge power advantage. Right? No need to go and access uh, DRAM uh, uh, off-chip to actually get weights. Um, there's a lot of research at the moment on this. Um, 
here are some results. Uh, this gentleman, uh, uh, Song Han, is doing most of the work. It's very impressive um, uh, from Stanford. Um, he did some work on optimizing convolutional networks on GPUs, and I'll just let, let you look at the numbers. Uh, they're, they're absolutely amazing. Uh, he, did it, he did it again on an LSTM network. Again, very, very impressive network. Uh, huge speed ups, huge power savings, and the ability to run everything on the FPGA itself without external memory. And uh, this third paper uh, is, uh, is uh, so the first two are using Xilinx chips. Uh, and the, uh, sorry, the second one is using Xilinx chips. The third one is using Intel, Intel chips. And they get similar results. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about quickly is that actually NVIDIA, uh, very recently, this is not more than two weeks old, maybe less, they published a new initiative for uh, open architectures uh, to build um, DL, deep learning accelerators for IoT. So basically, it's a bunch of, uh, of building blocks implemented in Verilog, right? And it's all on GitHub. So you can grab that, and you can actually build your hardware solution based on that. Okay, it's, it's brand new. Um, and I'm mentioning it because you can actually use F1 instances to, to test and simulate everything. F1 instances will not be the final device. Again, this is targeted at IoT. But if you want to synthesize and test, you can do it with F1 instances. Okay, so you should definitely check this out. It's uh, very, very interesting. So as a conclusion, well, the battle rages on, right? Uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, a few days, a few years ago, you know, it was just about CPUs, and then GPUs showed up, and now FPGA shows up, and some people implement ASICs. So it's, you know, it's fascinating. There is no, uh, uh, no single tool that will do everything right. And uh, just like for software, we knew that already, but now it's true for hardware as well. So work through your application requirements, work through you know, uh, your time to market, what, what skills do you have, et cetera. And don't, don't forget, the, the AWS marketplace might just have what you need just a few clicks away. And you know, we're happy to give you many options when it comes to hardware and software. So please explore them, please test them, and send us feedback. You know, we love feedback, and using that, we can improve our products. Uh, here are all the links that I mentioned. Um, F1 instances, um, the uh, repo on GitHub with all the uh, SDK and HDK stuff, uh, and the samples, much more samples that are uh, uh, just like the one I showed you, and those research papers that I mentioned. And I, I really, really recommend them, they're uh, uh, extremely well written. Well, that's it for me. Uh, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much.